Hello guys, today we're going to talk about dependency injection in ASP.NET Core. We're going to use it for implementing in my application a MongoDB client that is reusable. As you can see right now in my application I have this handler in here that is used across multiple classes in this food diary folder where I reuse this handler and read-only block over and over again everywhere. So right now I'm using just a normal MongoDB configuration as explained in the ASP.NET documentation where I have a singleton with the settings, I add the service and then I inject the service in each one of the applications that I need. Now, so we can go inside, uh, uh, let's do a little bit of cleanup of all the tabs that I have in my uh, editor so that everything is going to be nice and clean. Um, and we're going to see how each one of those classes actually right now are working. So we can see, for example, inside this full diary all, I have this block of code. I don't want to repeat over and over this block of code. I want to have a class that handles all of it in a data layer context, uh, context maybe, without having to know the MongoDB settings, without having to know about uh, which collection needs to, needs to retrieve. And then uh, I want to reuse uh, essentially the collection over and over, which is also what is uh, highlighted in the food, uh, um, in the MongoDB uh, documentation. So what we need to do to get this going? What we need to do is to get, um, what we need to do, we need to follow essentially the guide. So here that's the method that I'm reusing. And now, if you go on the MongoDB documentation and we're going to read about connecting to a database, we're going to find something really important. What we're going to find is that the client needs to be, it's strongly recommended to reuse and store a MongoDB client instance in a global place, either as a static variable on in an IOC container with a singleton lifetime, an IOC it's invariant of control um, container, of course. Now, what the documentation is, is essentially telling us is that it's better to reuse, it's best practice to reuse the Mongo client uh, uh, instance somewhere where we can get access for multiple places. Then the documentation continues by saying that, however, multiple Mongo client instances created with the same settings will utilize the same connection pool underneath. Unfortunately, certain type of settings are not able to be converted for equality. For instance, the cluster configurator property is a delegate and only its address is known for comparison. If you wish to construct multiple Mongo clients, ensure that your delegates are all using the same address for the intent to the share, it, to the share connection pools. Let's see how we can put all of this into practice. So, as we said before, our final goal is to move all of this block, which is, um, is used over and over in each of our classes inside an external data context, which is going to receive the connection, uh, Mongo database connection settings from the startup class, um, and which settings are coming from the app settings.json. All of those settings are going to be added to this shared class and this class is going to be injected to the service and then the service is going to be injected into each one of our, um, of our classes. So let's head back to the documentation of ASP.NET Core and let's have a look what they say about dependency injection. So what are the benefits of uh, dependency injection? The dependency injection is uh, uh, address this problem through the use on interface based class to abstract the dependency implementation. Um, so which means that our implementation is going to be hidden. So we don't have to worry if anything changes. Registration of the dependency in a service container ASP.NET Core provides a built-in service container iService provider. Service are typically registered in the app startup configure service method. Injection of the service into the constructor of the class where it's used. The framework task that the framework takes on the responsibility of creating an instance of the dependency and disposing of it when it's no longer needed. 
So let's see what, uh, what this actually means. This actually means that we don't need to worry about the, if the underlying class does any changes, the, we don't have to worry inside our methods. While if we are going to use a generic class and we implement it, instead what is going to happen is that we need to worry about the, any changes in the configuration method, any changes in the dependencies, any change in the settings. We are going to require um, we're going to require to make a lot of change in each one of the classes using the service we want. So in this example, in the documentation, we can see how we have a class with a red message, and this red message method is then used in a separate class. And to be used, you need to initialize the class with a new uh, keyword, and then use, uh, um, and then we're going to use this to write a generic console log message. Now what is going to happen in this case that if we want to change the my dependency class and have any any initialization then we need to change the method everywhere else which of course can be cumbersome to to realize so so here we can see how we are just writing the line a line of text initialize the class and then use the newly defined dependency to write a message underneath below. Any changes, again, any changes are going to, are going to make our dependency harder to deal with. Let's see now how we can use an interface to achieve the same result. So we have an interface uh, which is called I my dependency, and inside we define a, uh, a method which is void returns nothing, red message takes a string message. And now uh, the our my dependency class implements, uses the I my dependency uh, implementation and then everything else right now stays basically the same. As the documentation tells us, we need to add um, it into the service class uh, inside the configure services method. So inside here we add a services add scope to my dependency, I my dependency, my dependency, and this is going to tell the compiler where to get the I my dependency method whenever we're going to inject it into a class. So continuing with our example, what we're going to find is that our uh, our class is going to be used and we have a, a my dependency which takes the i my dependency method and we don't have to worry about calling it with the new keyword it's going to be checked in and now we're going to use the write message method that was defined in the constructor class and we can just call the method write, uh, write message exactly like before but now what we're going to uh, now what the documentation shows us is that we can actually change what is happening in our application. So what is happening in our application? Um, as the documentation says, it, it's that in the dependency injection pattern, the controller doesn't use the concrete my dependency and that it's easy to change the implementation that the controller uses without modifying the controller. So if I'm going to change how the um, red message method works, I don't actually have to go, uh, go around my app and change my implementation everywhere else. All I have to do is to make a small change um, and everywhere else is going to work. Um, everything is going to work just fine because the dependency injection is going to have everything exactly as before. So let's go forward. And now let's move to the, let's see what we can do. We can change our, uh, um, we're going to have a second model and now we're going to have our dependencies going to change. Um, and we're going to use an iLogger class from the .NET implementation. So the, the, the iLogger class is going to be uh, injected into the IMA dependency to class. And then the write message method now is going to use the logger, log information method, rather than the console write 
message method. And what this means? This means that everywhere we are going to use not a console log, we're going to use, uh, we're going to, leave, uh, to see an info in our console. Now let's go back to our application and let's see how we can put in practice what we just saw. So first of all, we need to move all of this inside an external class. For uh, this reason, I created a, a class called the food diary data, cont uh, data context. which I already wrote and the content is in here. So what I do, I inject into this class, I inject the iMongo database settings. I take the new Mongo client, the database and the food diary, and I create everything that is required. The food diary is the collection. Right now I'm using a, a food diary um, type however this could be changed and use just a generic type and then retrieve different collections every time however right now uh, this app is very very simple i don't need to do that so the settings again are coming from our app settings.json exactly like before and our get method in this class is just going to return a food diary of type a mongo, a mongo collection uh, food diary coming from mongo driver and now this get method is what I'm going to inject inside my other classes in order to get everything. So the first thing, as we saw before in the documentation, we need to add a service. Now, in this case, I'm not going to add, um, uh, not going to add a service, but I'm going to add a, a singleton. Um, and let's see, add singleton. And now we add of type food diary i'm waiting for the autocomplete to happen there you go and we initialize it yeah everything is okay and now that this is uh, in our startup class we can actually inject it so uh, first of all we can see how from postman i have all my api methods that are getting called the app seems to take a little bit of time to run today. I'm not sure what's going on. Yeah, there you go. So our app is uh, taking uh, all of our uh, details. This one is working uh, by the, yeah, it's working again. So let's go back to our class and we're gonna change this to get on, uh, to get the, uh, the food diary data context to be applied. So we have a private read only uh, variable of type um, food diary data context. Let's see if the import is going to work. Uh, mm, no, it didn't work. Yeah, it's complaining that I cannot find the variable. Okay, let's do this import manually then. Let's go scroll back up and use the persistence uh, namespace, which is the one where I registered the class. Yeah, it seems to be fine. So now in the initialize method, we can remove everything and we are going to change all of this with the food diary data context. So we have a food diary data context. And now we have for diary data context is equal to for diary data context. It's a bit slow the computer right now, maybe because I'm recording at the same time. This one we don't need anymore. And now this becomes for diary data context dot get. So we get the instance of the method. And now we can just use the same method again and everything should just work fine yeah everything looks okay here the data context is injected so we go back to postman we just did the get all so let's see if we get all works well uh the restart no it's very slow my computer today what's going on hey eh? 
it uh, seems now it is running Let's see yes it's working so now we can implement the same pattern over and over across the other methods all I have to do is essentially copy paste this block of code and replace the mongo collection uh, uh, section that I was in before and then of course the get method to actually get the class and add the import using persistence and now we go to the next method Ah, it's a bit slow as usual. Okay, now start again. Run. And now we can see that it's working fine again. It's working exactly like before. Nothing actually changed. However, the underlying implementation is reusing a method.